All right. Is that cool? Did that pump you off? <laughs> well, I mean, we've just started recording, so you've completely destroyed my intro, as always. Um, <laughs> so I'll say hello and welcome back to another episode of The Balance Breakdown. And today we are breaking down UFC 253, Israel Adesanya and Paolo Costa, the aftermath. Uh, today I am joined by the Polish version of Joshua Fabia. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sean McGuinness. Hello, sir. How you doing? Honestly, like, when you're about to give me my intro, every part of my body just tenses up for a second. <laughs> like, I'm so, that's probably the worst one you've given me yet. But Look, I, mean, I don't even know where to start with that. That's, I think it's pretty accurate, geez. actually. In some ways, probably. Yeah. I mean, you know. Look at the look at the, the 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 differences between sorry the similarities between you and Josh Fabia, right? Sociopath, you're, yeah. <laughs> sociopath, you're leeching on an already <laughs> well-known household name brand. Uh, That's true. You're That's attempting true. to pigeonhole something into the MMA sphere that nobody has any time for, and Matt Serra hates you. So, like. That's true. The Matt Serra one was yeah. That was the hardest one to take for sure. When yeah. yeah. When Matt Sarah said he hated me, but what can you do? What can you do? He's one of my heroes for sure. Yeah, I mean, these things happen. But anyway, overall, um, how are you, Sean? Are you doing well? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm probably more, um, I don't know, kind of sprightly than the last time I was on the podcast. Um, because, you know, after two weeks off, the alcohol has finally left my system. Good. Um, and yeah, I'm feeling much, much healthier. Uh, how about yourself? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. Thank you. I mean, I wish it was Jack that I was talking to and not you, but we are where we are. <laughs> we are where we are. Jack. Uh, like, Jack if Jack can't make the call, I'm the understudy for sure. <laughs> like, I'm the Michael Chandler to. Um, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jack Jack's. Justin Poirier. Yeah, Jack's Dustin Poirier for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'd actually go as far as to say that. Who would I say that you are? Don't, don't. You're going to say Jeff Hughes again. Don't compare me <laughs> to Jeff Hughes. <laughs> again. I mean, you and Jeff Hughes are very similar in a lot of ways. Um, it is true at the moment. Like we have a very similar sort of gas tank. To be fair, like. I mean, to be honest, out of the two of us, I, I, I physically look more like Jeff Hughes than you do. That's for sure. Um, Appreciate that. But yeah, I mean, the the card overall, I was pretty impressed actually. I watched it. I watched it front to back. Um, I stayed up for it, and I was, I was really really impressed. I thought that the overall like was. I mean, we'll get to the first fight of the night in a bit, and that was just absolute fucking useless, useless all round. It was two people, right? That were just terrible at 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 the things that they're supposed to be good at, and it was just for not. It was like hilarious MMA to watch. Absolutely hilarious MMA to watch. Um, and then, you know, it kind of, it kind of really picked up from there, to be honest. I thought from, from Ludovic Klein onwards, it was actually a pretty, pretty good card. A couple of shit points, but you know, this is MMA. Mm. Um, but yeah, and then it culminated in, in the, the last three fights were just absolutely unreal. Absolutely unreal. Um, but before we jump into the card, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the news that's happened sort of post-fight. First thing, what's your opinion on Adesanya's celebration? The, the, the two parts of the celebration. So just break down the two parts. I'd like, There's one that's obviously, in my mind, quite, quite a bit, but what, what's the so, other part of the celebration? So the one is when he um, gyrated on a, uh, on, a, on a physically hurt and finished yeah, Paolo Costa. Yeah. Yeah. The other one is when he went over to Eric Albarasin and told him that he was going to come on him. Wow, I, 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 that's the first time I've heard about that. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Is, so, so Izzy is did, um, Izzy did his lap of you know where he's walking around or whatever, and supposedly get Eric Albarasin shouted something at um, at Izzy about Alexander Volkanovsky. He's going to get slept by Henry Cejudo or whatever it is. Something to do with Alexander Volkanovsky and Henry Cejudo. And then Izzy goes over and starts to mouth off back at Eric Albarasin. And then it culminates in Izzy uh, making a wanker sign and telling Eric Albarasin that he's going to come on him. Um, he then finished with a Naruto run, which is obviously the only thing that you do after you tell a man you're going to come on him, right? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, so what do you think? Oh, I think it's a weird one, like, especially with the, 
gyrating was a good word that you you picked a good sort of podcast friendly word but i don't know i thought i thought it was a bit uncalled for but um it's one of those things like it's mma fighters will always do like extreme things like this like especially yeah. post win like yeah. especially certain individuals so i feel like after a certain amount of years watching the sport i i'm almost just in acceptance that there are a lot of guys especially at that top end or you know all levels of mma that just do crazy stuff um and you know did i think it's like a good thing to do after a win like probably not like it's kind of weird like both things are also kind of weird along with you know being disrespectful or whatever but i mean it's the sphere that we're in so i suppose the honest answer is i, I don't really or I try not to care. I try to be indifferent to what sort of fighters are doing outside the fights. But um, yeah, that <laughs> so, especially the second one, I had no idea. That that seems more just unusual to me. Like it's sort of past the point of disrespect. I think uh, I think psychologically, I can kind of not justify, but I can see the I can see the route to both. Right, like Eric Albarasin was the guy behind the Paulo Costa sort of gimmick and the black belt and the white belt and all this sort of stuff. He's the same guy that's behind Henry Cejudo and the snakes and the cushions mm. and all this absolute shite. Like he's the same guy. Like, just as a as 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 a slight deviation, if Eric Albarasin and Colby Covington ever come together, the world is going to end. Oh the yeah, for sure. The gimmick, <laughs> the gimmicks will just there be just so many. Yeah, it'd, be, it'd be ridiculous but um yeah so i think um i think the gyrating thing i kind of get it it's a dominance thing isn't it like he's just managed to put on one of the best displays that we've ever seen in a ufc title fight ever maybe um you know he, he said this on ariel ariel hawani show earlier and I, I i wonder whether it's true like i wonder whether we've ever seen a ufc title fight where the other person did not land a shot to the face oh uh maybe like forrest griffin anderson silver um i'm pretty sure there was barely anything landed in that at maybe. least punches wise by forrest but you're maybe. right there's not many there's not many you can really think of um i'm trying but, to think of yeah, yeah. sorry go on. yeah anyway like like you know it's a dominance thing it's a dominance thing with eric albarasin as well it's eric albarasin has obviously tried to get into izzy's head via costa and all this sort of stuff and and then you know he's gone and said something about izzy's teammate do i think the coming thing is justified not really i feel like it's a bit strange but equally like you said these guys are mma fighters and mma fighters are the extreme of the extreme when it comes to combat athletes um the gyrating thing, like, Jesus, is not the fucking worst thing we've seen in a cage, have we? Let's be honest. There have been far, 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 far worse things we've seen happen in an MMA cage um, than just one man gyrating on another man when he's down. Is it disrespectful? Yeah, sure. But, like, this is the fight game. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's about as primal as you're going to get. It's about as... It's about dominating each other. And Israel Adesanya absolutely dominated Paulo Costa. Um, but yeah, I mean, people are calling for him to be fined and this kind of stuff. Like, nah, I don't see it. I don't see it. It's, I don't, I don't see the justification for it, frankly. No, in the same breath though, like, it's like little moments like that, that when I'm trying to, you know, introduce friends to the sport that I love and everything else, that's like another moment where the people that aren't as in the know or like a little bit more casual or just outside the sport will be like, whoa, I don't want to, MMA is like a bad sport. Like, you know, it's people just doing crazy nah. things. I don't, I don't buy it, frankly. I mean, fucking, if you watch football, right? If you go and watch a game of football now, every time there's a foul called or whatever it is, the whole team will crowd around the ref and they'll push him and shove him and shout in his face and all this sort of stuff. Like, that's, if anything, that's worse because you've got 11 guys ganging up on one dude. You're going to have people spitting on the ref. You're going to have fucking Eric Cantona, judo kicks, uh, Kung Fu kicks some guy in a crowd. Like, like there are, there are parts of this all over the place, right? You go and look at kickboxing when that guy, I can't remember exactly the fight, but some guy, I think it was a Badahari fight, but some guy knocked out a guy and then his teammate came in and just sucker punched him in the back of the head because his brother lost or whatever it was. Like, there are, there are bad notes to all sports. And I think that, frankly, stuff like this, whether we like it or not, we're talking about it. Mm. Do you know what I, I mean? Yeah. Also, though, like, 
I suppose the difference with a sport like football is that, or, you know, say something like that happened in tennis or whatever, there isn't already a negative stigma that True. follows those types of sports. True. And I feel like MMA is always like from, you know, its inception been running away from a pretty negative stigma that people like you and me that love the sport, we also have to move away from when we're trying to get people into it. And things like this or, you know, Conor McGregor getting arrested in the hotel room or whatever, it's those stars that take all the headlines. Like, don't get me wrong, there'll be someone in, a, in an amateur show somewhere doing things worse than that. But the point is all the cameras are focused on Izzy Adesanya, everyone yeah. else. So I when they do that. something like that, you know, but I, I get what you're saying as well. It, you know, it is the fight game, but I was just yeah. trying being different at this point. Because, I mean, even in boxing, right? The biggest star of all time, Mike Tyson, goes to jail for rape. Goes, you know, he bites another man's ear off in the in in the ring. Floyd Mayweather is has been convicted of beating up his wife or ex-wife. You know, like this shit is not uncommon. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but equally though, you get someone like um, I, I know that Muhammad Ali is the exception to the rule, but you get someone that comes along like that and they elevate the entire sport to a completely different level. You know, and make people's uh, sort of perceptions of the sport different as well but yeah, yeah. i mean i'm gonna move on after this point because otherwise like we're just gonna be talking about this forever, yeah th but, this is a big debate in itself but, like, to be fair yeah muhammad ali is muhammad ali would have been muhammad ali without sports in my opinion mm, for sure like, I'm really, he's 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 a man that's that comes once in a gen in like a hundred generations do you know what i mean um mm. but yeah we'll, we'll move on to, to the second point of news and that's Conor McGregor and Dana White spat, and also the Conor McGregor Manny Pacquiao, and also the Conor McGregor Dustin Poirier supposed exhibition match. Um, Charity fight. What is also, going on? That's really interesting because Conor McGregor has really proven in the last sort of week or two who really calls the shots there, right? So I don't know if you've seen, but um, Conor McGregor Dustin Poirier, Conor offers Dustin a charity match for the Good Fight Foundation, which, to be honest, on the whole, on on the face of it, is a brilliant idea right it was a charity mma match match i guess you have to call it if it's for charity right um connor was going to host it in the dublin arena all this kind of stuff everything's grand he was going to you know whatever um dustin accepted the ufc have then reported dana white reported today that he's offered connor mcgregor and dustin poirier a ufc bout Really? I've missed that. That's crazy. So, so to me, that's Dana White being shit scared of both men just going and having a charity MMA match outside of the UFC banner, relinquishing that power, and all of a sudden, he has that problem, that Conor McGregor problem to deal with. But, I mean, that to me is hilarious. Give me your thoughts on Manny Pacquiao, Conor. <laughs> well, I, I think it's another another crazy boxing match that, you know, Manny Pacquiao is probably going to run through him, but it doesn't make any difference. The amount of people that are going to view it is not going to change, you know, based on that perception. Um, but yeah, I think all of these things going on with Connor and the UFC, the sort of power play between him and the organization is so, it's so interesting just because there's not ever been another fighter that has come close to outgrowing the UFC. And yep. even in these times where, you know, Maybe his name's not coming up in the headlines for, you know, the same sort of right reasons as it was when he just become, you know, the champ champ and everything else. Yeah. He's still, like, finding ways to not only become relevant, but like you say, actually put the organization on the ropes. And I had no idea that he'd been offered the fight against Poirier in the UFC, but that is huge. Like, that may be a first ever that someone has managed to leverage the UFC because the UFC does not like it when fighters try to leverage them. So for them to do that, it shows it had a big impact. Yeah. And Artem Lovov made a really good point on the Aero Hawani. I'm sorry, on the, um, on the bash with PT, PT Carroll and oh, brilliant. Um, amazing podcast, amazing podcast. Um, but he made a really good point, which is the UFC have shareholders. Now it's not just Dana and Lorenzo and they have to please those shareholders. And the best way to please those shareholders is Conor McGregor. That is a great point. 
So Dana White, <laughs> can, uh, I mean, literally, Artem pivoted from shitting on Zabira Tukugov as much as he could to them being like, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, Connor will definitely fight in the UFC again. Just so you know, like, absolutely fight in the UFC again. Absolutely. Brilliant. Um, but it, we just, just on the Manny Pacquiao thing, so the last two fights that Manny Pacquiao has had and won, Adrian Broner only ever lost three fights in his career. Keith Thurman handed him his first loss. Keith Thurman, absolute monster, right? Monster. And Connor's now going to go in, supposedly, against Manny at, I think he's going to go at 170. I think that's what they've said. Um, mm. and, uh, and yeah, supposedly have a scrap. And Jesus Christ. I mean, what's, what's hilarious is people are going to be, like Teddy Atlas has come out today saying that Connor has a chance to beat Manny Pacquiao because father time gets everyone. Are we doing this again? Are we really yeah, doing this again? I know. It's a loose argument, isn't it? I actually think in a lot of ways as well, Manny Pacquiao is probably a much more dangerous uh, matchup than, than Floyd in a lot of ways. You know, whether you believe or not, Floyd sort of carried that fight and kept it going. I don't think Manny Pacquiao, his style allows him to carry a fight or carry a fighter. So like, mm. he's always been nonstop aggression, like super high volume, like, you hope that this isn't one where Connor ends up seriously hurt because I think Manny is really that dangerous, you know. Because what's going to happen here, right, is Connor, the, the Connor vitriol is going to be Manny's, Manny's going to walk forward, he's going to throw shots, and I'm a counter striker. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, that's going to be the vitriol, right? Yeah, and, every, and yes. On the state of it, on, 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 the, like, on the face of it, that's a very true statement. It's a very, very true statement. It is. In, yeah, in like reality, think... it's tough, right? It's tough. Yeah, you're right. Like, in, in theory, like, a pretty convincing argument could be made. Like, um, who, who was it? It was Marquez versus Pacquiao, like that really iconic counterpunch that he threw himself onto. But in practice, I mean, these people are just in completely different worlds in boxing. You know, it's... I don't know, <laughs> but again, I'm going to be watching. So yeah, that's the thing as well, it. isn't it? Like we, yeah. you know, we've said all this shit about oh, it's this, it's that. Uh, yeah, we're going to watch it, right? Do you know what's crazy as well about Juan Manuel Marquez and um, Manny Pacquiao? Do you know how many times mm. they fought each other? Is it four? It is four. It's mad, that isn't it? Yeah, it's four. He uh, he, they had a draw. Uh, the first, I think, the first fight was a draw. Just looking mm. now. The first fight was a draw. The second fight, he won by only a split decision. And then the second two fights, he lost a split decision. Uh, and then he got knocked out, obviously. Oh, sorry, sorry. He won a majority decision and then got knocked out by him, which, you know, is what it is. So, yeah, what's crazy is Juan Manuel Marquez has lost six fights. Three of those, half of his fights. I lost this to Manny Pacquiao. Yeah. They were all brutal fights from what I can remember as well. Like yeah, all yeah, really, yeah. I think they're always, fights. yeah, stylistically quite tricky for each other. But yeah, anyway, right. Let's, uh, and, uh, sorry, the final thing to talk about before we just get dragged into everything else is, do you think it's a dick move for Conor McGregor to share DMs between him and Dana White? <laughs> what about the, the bro code? <laughs> yeah, broken. bro code. Uh, you know, it's not it's not a great move. Um, to be honest, the only main thing I took from reading those DMs was um, I kind of gained a bit of respect for Dana as a promoter because the thing I was scared of when I heard that they'd been revealed was that Connor had suggested the Diego fight and then Dana would have responded like, yeah, yeah, I'm really on board. We'll, we'll throw Diego in there. But the fact that Dana instantly responded saying, if we made that fight, you should terminate my promoter's license. I just thought it was, you know, I just thought it was brilliant because, you know, it's the way you'd hope that a promoter would be. Because I'm sure we'll get on to Diego in a bit, but um, that is not a fight to make with his best interests at heart. Well, can I offer a second thing? Yeah. You know, you hear all this time about, oh, I'm going to reach out to my management team and they're going to sort this out and they're going to do this. It seems, lads... The, the biggest star in our sport gets fights in Instagram DMs. <laughs> yeah, there's no middleman. <laughs> it's just him and Dana on Instagram. 
Right. And we think all this bullshit about managers and promoters and this and that is real? Come on. Conor McGregor chats to fucking Dana White in a DM and be like, bro, give me, da- give me Diego Sanchez. And Dana's like, maybe. <laughs> no, it was a strong no. I feel like he's just like... I don't know. Ah. I think Dana at this point is just such so full of fucking vitriol that actually more time it's like he's going to say something and then he may just do the opposite right like yeah may just do the opposite anyway right Izzy Costa tell me what did you think well it was a weird one because I think most of us thought it was going to go the way that it did you know or sorry it was going to be um, a win for Izzy but I don't think any of us thought it was going to be quite as dominant as it ended up uh, the most surprising things for me, I think, from the off was almost how timid Paolo looks. Like, he's obviously a fighter that's been marketed on, never taking a backward step, um, you know, and being super, super aggressive. But from the off, it was like he just really didn't want to push the pace. And um, I know I spoke to you the day after the fight, whether that was a conscious game plan made by, you know, his team, like Henry Cejudo and all of them, um, worrying that Paolo didn't have a fourth and a fifth round in the tank. So, you know, take the first round off, feel them out sort of thing. Who knows whether that was the case. But what I think was the case either way was that when they tried that game plan, he seemed to realise really quickly that even feeling uh, Izzy out, he was massively out of his depth striking-wise because even at a distance, he was just getting, you know, he was just getting picked off. Yeah, so I think I've watched the fight a few times now. Not that there's that much to watch, but, you know. I mean, in time, yeah. there's not that much to watch. But so I actually don't think it's anything to do with Paolo looking timid. I think that immediately what happened is Izzy just beat him everywhere. Everywhere. I think the thing that I did find as I was talking to one of my friends at the time is. Costa walked out and looked nervous, more nervous than he usually does, right? And, you know, we could talk about whether that has an effect or not. But uh, you'll remember when Connor and Donald fought, or when Jose Aldo and Connor fought, you know, Jose Aldo acted differently. Donald Cerrone acted differently on the walkout, right? And we know what happened in both of those fights, right? And that's not to say, like, this is, you know, just to justify this a little bit, Costa is is having the the fourteenth fight of his career, right? Just the fourteenth fight of his career, and he's going in against a guy that's had a hundred fights or ninety nine fights at the time. Is currently undefeated. Is the champion. This is the biggest fight of your fucking life on the other side of the world, right? And it's like what four a.m. or something stupid like that that they're fighting, and you know. To go in and look different is is it is it is what it is, right? Like I, I th- there's no there's no judgment there, but the fight itself, like, yeah, is he just is he just cut off everything, right? Like, what do we know? We know that Costa wants to blunder forward, put you against the fence, and finish there. Cool. We know that Costa's got a really good right leg, right right sided kick, which he landed a couple of times, right? Like two or three times. But what did Izzy do perfectly? Well, he fainted him. He made sure that he didn't headhunt. He didn't give Costa... If he didn't throw anything, he doesn't give Costa a chance to counter anything. And everything was just leg kick, leg kick, leg kick, leg kick, leg kick, leg kick. And yeah, we saw the damage by the end of the first round. It was just an absolute masterclass. An absolute masterclass. I remember I said to my friend on that Friday, on the Friday when I was training, I said to the guy that works at reception, I was like, it's going to be Izzy inside three. That's my, that was my thing. Izzy inside three. And he was like, no way, no way. And I was like, I'm telling you, I have a feeling. Is he inside three? And, and once, for once, I was right. For once. Um, but I was, I was just blown away. Honestly, I was blown away. I mean, Costa's going to come back, right? Costa will come back. We'll see him again. And, you know, he'll probably be knocking a few dudes out. You know, like maybe if Darren Till wins, you do Darren Till, Paolo Costa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a lot of fun. That's a lot of fun. Because, you know, Izzy is saying that Jared Cannonier is the next guy in line. Fine. Maybe you do Paolo Costa Darren Till if he gets through Jack Manson. That would be a lot of fun as well. 
Um, but yeah, just to, to the one thing that we haven't been doing on the podcast that I now want to do is, um, is go through the picks. So you and Jack both had Adesanya by TKO round mm. four. I had Adesanya in a unanimous decision. So, <laughs> I mean, I was, I was the furthest out, right? Like, Jesus. Um, the next fight is the craziest. So tell me, Jan Blachowicz. Oh, my God. Your, your uncle, oh Uncle Jan, God. versus the most athletic man in UFC history by his own admission. Oh, man. I think I'd let down my uncle here. Like, really bad. Really bad. You know what? Let me just go through my thoughts and you can agree or disagree here. It's like, I think that the Jan performance is actually more impressive than the Adesanya performance. The reason why I say that is Jan Blahovic built his career back up off a three-fight skid, or even a four-fight skid, I think it was, right? Taking some, some heavy knockouts and some losses. He then builds his way back up, goes on a three, four, five fight winning streak. He then steps in, in the, ear, the wake of John Jones, to a guy that had just arguably beaten John Jones, the greatest fighter of that division ever, right? He goes in there and there's no scratches on him. I think Dom landed like two jabs, two real jabs. The first two kicks that Blahowitz threw just destroyed Reyes' ribs. And by the end of that fight, he had painted his nose literally across his face. Mm. Jan went in and the reads that he made, and I'm going to let you talk about that because I remember you said it on the phone, the reads he made just worked absolutely perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. And to go and to win that title, having the career that he's had, being the man he has, that he is, knowing that his wife is just outside pregnant, and I'm sure that doesn't affect him in the fight, right? But, but you know, everything surrounding him, I just thought it was amazing. Absolutely amazing performance. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I'd, I'd agree with you as well. I, I think for me, this was by far the most shocking result. Um, I probably felt most confident in this pick out of all the picks that I made in the card. And, you know, sort of Jan just came out there with a perfect game plan. Um, right. You know, when we were talking about this fight beforehand, I sort of made the comment about how going back through Jan's fights, I thought it was impressive. Um, how good he was as a combination striker for a light heavyweight. Um, and obviously, it seems like a bit of a, of a general comment to make, but I think especially in how he applied those combinations in this fight, like it showed how dangerous he can be when he's doing that. Because my big fear for Jan and for anyone that goes against Dominic Reyes is closing that gap, you know, getting from the space that Dominic makes with his footwork without getting hit with that, you know, horrific counter left uppercut or counter um, left cross that he throws. But again, one of the things that makes Jan unique is most of these guys coming at Dominic Reyes, they're throwing one strike. If you think of yes. people like OSP, they're one strike fighters. They throw one strike and if they're overextended, Dominic Reyes makes them pay for it. Yep. Right. But when you look at Jan Blakovic, he was throwing one strike, then he was following up with another and maybe a four piece to close that gap. So he was never leaving any breathing room mm -hmm. for Dominic Reyes to, you know, manage to open up and really capitalize with his uppercuts. Like there was a few times he threw it and it missed just because whenever he was going for it, he thought the combination had ended. But you've got Jan, you know, a, com a combination striker, which is obviously rare for light heavyweight, that just wasn't giving him that breathing room. Um, and, you know, I, I know we were talking about the body kicks as well at the end of the combination. It really paid dividends as the fight went on that, um, yeah, I think Dominic Reyes just couldn't get his usual rhythm. I agree. And I think, you know, the couple of things that he, he made from a technical perspective that were really impressive is he always kept his foot on the outside of Dom's foot, meaning mm. that he always had the ability to circle off away from the power hand, always. Every single time, if you go back and watch that fight, whenever they come into any form of striking range, Jan's left foot is outside Dom's right foot. Amazing phenomenal like phenomenal and then as you say there's a four five six punch combination and he ends with a body kick and the reason why i think the kicks were so important one because they were damaging but two because it takes his head off the center line right if you lean back enough 
then the size of reach, the, the, the wingspan of his legs is just so long that it's going to be hard for Dom unless he really reaches. And then again, if he really reaches, we're looking at a different scenario where you're probably going to get clipped with something or you're off balance or whatever it is. So yeah, I was just, I was brilliantly, brilliantly impressed. Really, really, really impressed with the Amblohovic. Um, I'm not sure what happens with Jan now. He's to, I mean, the call out at the end, I think, was really silly. Really, really silly. So in his post-fight press conference, he immediately got on the mic and was like, John Jones, where are you? Don't be scared. And it's like, oh, Jesus. Like, John Jones, and maybe you can correct me if you, if you think differently, but like, John Jones doesn't relinquish the belt that he was happily defending, essentially, right? To go chase heavyweight, for all of a sudden Jan Blahovic to knock out Reyes and don't be like, oh my God, I need that belt. No, 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 no. What you do is you either say, Tiago Santos, like you're my most recent loss, get through Glover Teixeira, you're next. Or call out someone, anyone, right? Anyone. Tell John Jones you're going to fucking follow him to heavyweight if you want to do that. But Christ alive, like talk about shitting on a good moment. Right. Yeah, it's was, it was a bit of a funny one. I think it's an unfortunate time for him to come champion just because the division is in a weird sort of no man's land. Like with John Jones and DC sort of moving on, it, the division is in a very weird place because there's not been a champion named John Jones or Daniel Cormier since nine years. Was it nine years ago? So it, it's a really weird time for the division because he also called out Daniel Cormier, which I thought was an even more sort Stupid. of yeah, pointless, you know, call out. Because I mean, Daniel Cormier even said to me, he was like, I'm not even rising to this. Like, I'm done. <laughs> like, I've literally just fought Stipe three times. Why would I, I come back down, you know? Um, I just, I don't know. I just like your point to me says everything. You're right. It's been nine years. So take the mantle. Believe that you're the king, right? Believe you're the king of that division rather than being like, oh, if I don't beat John Jones, I'm not, I'm not. Fuck off. He's gone, right? It's your division now. <laughs> Move on. Right. He's left. He, like, uh, I don't know. I just feel like you're right. Like, because there hasn't been a champion not named John Jones or Daniel Cormier in so, so long, it, like, John Jones essentially is the like, heavyweight division, right? But I yeah. just feel like Jan missed a really, really big chance to get on that mic and just be like, whoever's next, I'm the fucking king. Mm. You don't even say John Jones's name. You make it about you. Yeah, it's so hard though, isn't it? Just because obviously, as well as John Jones' shadow sort of hanging over the division, everyone wants his scalp at this point. Like, probably like a win over John Jones is probably one of the biggest you can get in MMA. If not, it probably is the biggest you can get. Um, you know, there's a reason why you've got everyone from Izzy to Francis Ngannou, you know, trying to call him out and make fights with him. But, um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I just think it's, it's so hard because even though Jan Blakovic won, it's so weird. It almost feels like he's got like an interim title in a really strange way. Yeah, Just yeah, because yeah, yeah. you know there's another guy that no one's beaten that's just sort of lingering, you know, on the peripheral. I mean, if it was me and I was Jan Blahovic and I had a state of mind in that, in that moment, because look, he just fucking won the title, right? You yeah. Say whatever he wants yeah. to say. Like, if it's me, you play the longer game, right? And that longer game is you're like, Thiago Santos, you're next. Like, if, if Volkan Ozdemir, if you get a few fights, you're next. Like, he's got somewhat of a name. You go and absolutely smash these guys out of the park. Let's say he runs, he defends that title three, four times with, like, just as good a performances as now. Then he has a case to be like John Jones, where you at? Mm. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, it just, I don't know, it just really... It just, 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 just feels illegitimate, like you say. It just feels like now we're just waiting for John to come back and be like, all right, I'll fight for my belt again. <laughs> ah, I want John fuck. back. <laughs> yeah. Feel like pure shit, just want John Jones back. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Um, so to me, the next fight is fight of the night. Performance of the night, at least. One of the craziest first rounds we have ever seen in MMA, especially in the UFC. Like... I mean, for anyone that didn't watch it, go and fucking watch it. It was phenomenal. But, you know, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I fucked up. Sorry. Here we go. Jan Blahovic, Sean, 
picks against his uncle, Dominic Reyes, round one KO. Oh, God. You just had to read Gross. it, didn't you, Harry? Why couldn't you just move on to, to Royal versus Kai Kara France? Jack goes KO round two. I go <laughs> Reyes, KO, TKO round three. So we all picked against Uncle Jan, uh, nice. which is shit of us, but it is what it is. Um, or I, though I think, I think actually yours at the time, your pick for Roy Val, Kai Kara France, was the stupidest pick I heard on the podcast. And then actually... It wasn't that far <laughs> it was away. It pretty close. <laughs> it really wasn't that far away. This is literally my proudest moment on this So you picked Roy Val by Omar Plata submission. And he actually chucked an Omar Plata at Kai Kara. And at yeah, but two, I said two flying knees before that as well. Yeah, but that wasn't recorded. Um, Jack what? had Jack had Roy Val by United decision and I had the same. But yeah, talk to me about this. Like, Jesus Christ, what a fight. I absolutely love this one. I think that there's a couple of interesting things with it as well. Um, the first one is that if you look back, it was probably like a year and a half ago now, the UFC were thinking about, you know, cancelling the flyweight division entirely. And, you Hilarious. know, Hilarious. yeah, w- when you get a fight like this, you just thank your lucky stars that, um, you know, whatever happened, happened to keep the division there. Um, but yeah, I thought this was absolute craziness. I thought also the sort of analysis we gave to it was pretty close as well. That, you know, Kai Kara France and anyone going against Brandon Royval has to somehow slow down the fight and keep him out of the chaos. Because once he gets it there, it's so hard to get him back out. Um, and obviously the, the big exchange of the fight was where Brandon Royville went from almost Johnny Walker in himself, like throwing that front kick and then getting, you know, Ray Blam with that right hand and then wobbling and somehow having the presence of mind to throw that spinning elbow. Like that may be one of the best like one-off trades in UFC history. If you're thinking of like maybe that Romero Costa, like Romero gets dropped, looks away and then punches him. I probably put it. In fact, I probably put it behind Scott Smith versus Pete Sell, and um, the one where I think it's Smith gets hurt with a liver shot. He like clutches his body and then comes back with the overhand. But that was ridiculous. It was, yeah, that that was insane. But this was way up there, you know. Um, and another interesting thing with Brandon Royval, which I forgot, which my little brother was talking to me about, is that there was the big thing that came out in the press after he beat Tim Elliott where they, they basically interviewed him after the fight. And they're like, oh, how do you feel? You just got the biggest win ever. And he was like, mate, I feel fucking terrible. I got to go back to my job on Monday. I've not got the, the bonus. I've not been exciting enough. And they're like, what are you talking about? You just, you know, I'm, he's like, nah, this, I don't even want to do this interview. I'm sad. Um, me and my brother were wondering whether because of that <laughs> bizarre pressure he has from this, wanting to get away from this nine to five job, He's forced himself to be one of the most exciting fighters on the roster. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, he's, he's super interesting. I agree. And, you know, in a way, I, I feel sorry for Kai Kara France because this was supposed to be City Kickboxing's night, right? And it fucking yeah. wasn't. Like, Brandon Royval just came out and was like, oh, you want to you wanna do, like, Muay Thai type pace? Yeah, sorry, we're not doing that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put us both in a blender and see which one blends first, right? That is a great analogy for this fight, yeah. And, like, what was brilliant is when he got dropped by that right hand, it was almost like when his knees hit the floor, that was where the power came from to bounce him <laughs> up and slam that fucking spinning elbow into Kai Kara France. Like, Jesus, that was disgusting. And then the second round, he just came out and was like, I'm just going to fucking hurt you. Like, I'm just going to hurt you. Now... My only thing is they're talking about after Formiga fights Cody Garbrandt, whether you do Brandon Royval versus whoever that is, right? Now, you said, and rightly so, you need a way to stop the chaos. I think the way that you stop that chaos is by hurting Brandon Royval. Now, Kaikara France obviously hurt him enough, but I think UCA Formiga's power is way different than Kai Kara France's power. And I think that UCF Omega is also very good on the ground. Sorry, not UCF Omega. Who am I fucking talking about? I'm supposed talking to be talking about, about Davis and Figueredo. Yeah, Figueredo. Yeah, so yeah. Figueredo versus um, Davis and Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt. Like, Davis and Figueredo has a monster in his hands. And then on the ground, he's really, really good as well. Like, again, we haven't seen 
somebody get at Figueredo, right? Like we saw Joe B try and we saw what happened with both of those fights. Um, Royval, I don't know. It's tough, right? Like it's tough. I think the Davison, um, Davison Figueredo matchup is a tough one. I'd, I'd pick him to beat almost everyone else though. Almost everyone else. Yeah, it, it is. You're right. It's tough because the people he's been matched against, you know, they're not, they don't have the same physicality that Davison brings into the octagon. I think that's one of Davison's biggest strengths, to be honest. Like yes. he almost like phys- he's obviously super well-rounded, you know, he's, he's a fairly accurate puncher, but it is the phys- physicality and the power that he has that gives people Smashing. fits. And I don't yeah. think he would scramble either the same way someone like Tim Elliott. I don't think he would engage, no. um, yeah, I don't think he would engage him in those scrambles the same way others, other fighters have. Maybe because, you know, we may be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit just because, you know, he's only two fights in, as crazy as that is for how good he's looked. How about Brandon Moreno? You know, so, that, again, that's a big leap. But, you know, talk about chaos versus chaos. Yeah, my problem... So when I said I'd pick him against almost anybody, my, the, other, the other person I wouldn't pick him against is Brandon Moreno. <laughs> okay, everyone and apart from Brandon The reason Moreno for that is well. Brandon Moreno is essentially the same person as Royville, but he's just bigger and more experienced. Yes, super experienced. Yeah, yeah. And I think the only thing is you can't do the Moreno matchup, and that's because Br- Brandon Moreno is one, ranked number two, mm. right? And two, he deserves a shot, right? So if it's me... You give Brandon Royville somebody else. Pick anyone really above him. Like I think he's taken mm. rank seven now, rank seven or rank five, one of the two. Just give him anyone, like anyone in that top five. Let's see it. Well, the one that I really want is Askar Askarov. Oh, okay. Askar Askarov. Have you watched Askar Askarov? No, I'm not. I'm not familiar with him. Russian wrestler, phenomenal. Oh, nice. Go and watch his fights after you fucking absolute casual <laughs> but yeah after like that's the fight for me the fight is brandon royville askar askarov that's the fight if he beats askarov fuck it let's send him to the races let's do it let's give it yeah a but, that would be a really good one as well just because from what from what you're saying about his style he wouldn't be someone that would like really engage in the scrambles and he'd, he'd try and shut Royval down, which yes. is the, the big test that I think yes. he needs. Absolutely. And if he goes and he submits him or if he goes and finishes him, fine. Let's see it. Let's see it. Let's see it. Um, so we'll move on to, I mean, yeah, we'll move on to Ketlin Vieira versus Sajara Eubanks. It was all right. It was all, to me. To me, I kind of feel like Sajara Eubanks at one thirty-five just doesn't fit. Doesn't fit. She's too small for one thirty-five physically. She's too small, and we saw that with Caitlin Vieira. Like Caitlin Vieira, Irene Aldana, Holly Holm. It's going to be the same fight. It's the same fight over and over again, right? What we see is Sajara has some really nice boxing, some really nice counter boxing, but she just can't get on the inside because the range isn't there. Right, and she doesn't have the power to really make somebody respect that, right? And then allow mm. her to dict- dictate the fight a little bit more. The scrambles on the ground were fun, right? They were cool. We know that Eubanks has got, I think she's a black belt in jiu-jitsu and she goes and competes relatively often. That's cool, but I don't know. I just don't see it. I just don't see it for Sajara. Like, I mean, do you have any other thoughts on this fight? Like, it was pretty cut and dry. Yeah, I'd say the size difference definitely played um, a massive role. Like, Ketlin looked absolutely huge. Oh, in yeah, comparison. massive, massive. Um, but, yeah, like you were saying, if um, if Sajara could find a, a home at another weight class, I think she could do well because she still had impressive moments in this fight where she was managing to shut down um, the wrestling of Ketlin. But, like you say, when you're a fighter that is going against bigger and bigger opponents, as the rounds go on, it's so hard to handle your gas tank when every exchange you go into, you're the smaller person and, you know, you're always getting out muscled everywhere you go. Um, I think a couple of things that were pretty impressive from Ketlin's side, though, some of the outside trips she was going from, uh, from that sort of dirty boxing or the over mm. under clinch, looked really, really slick. Mm. Um, and, you know, you could tell she was maybe a bit cagey 
in terms of the grappling, just because of what you said about Eubanks was also, you know, a pretty decent grappler in her own right. Um, so I think there was some good stuff there, but I agree with you. I think um, another aspect of it was I think Ketlin was just trying to get, this was like a confidence building performance, you know? Yeah. Um, and with a last minute opponent change, I'm, I'm thinking the next, her next couple of fights, we'll probably see some more, more like showcase performances from her because before she ran into Irene Aldani, you know, this is someone that was really on a run, um, you know, for the title. So I think now she's got a bit more confidence back and she's got some ring time back in. We'll hopefully see some, some big performances from her. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've got nothing else to say other than that, other than the picks and the picks were, we all went Vieira by unanimous decision. So we yeah, all it was Marion Renault, wasn't it? Though when we picked, yeah, I mean, I would have picked yeah. the same thing. Frankly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Hakeem Duwadu versus Zubara Takugov. Um, Takugov missed weight by five, six pounds, which is just ridiculous. Um, I mean, I think we know the story there. The story was that Takugov decided to take the twenty, thirty percent fine and just stop cutting weight, right? And mm. obviously, Israel Adesanya was was vocal about that afterwards. Um, it was the split decision. How did you score the fight? Right, so I scored it. So I actually scored it from what I can remember, round one and two for um, Tahugov. Yeah, uh, very close. I actually think it, it came down to round one, who you picked, two one, okay. um, and then round three clearly for Hakeem. But I wasn't mad to be honest at the decision getting given to Hakeem, just because at the end of that third round. Um, he wasn't necessarily taking it off, but it seemed like Zabera reached a point where he was just trying to like dance the rest of the fight away. Whereas Hakeem was, well, I mean, he was literally screaming fight with me, you know, like he really wanted those exchanges to happen. So I wasn't too mad to be honest about the decision. So I scored it 2-1 to Hakeem. Um, I scored it 2-1 to Hakeem because uh, I and I think actually the, the second round was the swing round for me. Okay. Because in the yeah. first round, um, Zabara did manage to get his takedowns, right? But didn't really do too much with them, right? He held Hakeem for a little bit, had the back for a little bit, a little bit of cage wrestling, a little bit of control time there, but not vast amounts of scoring, right? There was nowhere near a submission. There was not lots of ground and pound. There wasn't really tons of damage landed. Um, and then in the first round, I thought Hakeem managed to like some good, land some good leg kicks and whatever. But but I thought Zubaira landed the the more damaging shots in the first round when he when he darted in and sort of sort of caught Hakeem's footwork off balance. The second round, Hakeem started to sprawl on those takedowns and stop those takedowns. Um, and then if he did get taken down, he got up straight away. And Zubaira didn't really land too much. If, from what I remember, I'd have to watch it back. But I thought Hakeem landed the, the more damaging strikes. And then obviously the third round was the clearest round of all of them. Zubaira looked tight and Hakeem just sort of did what he wanted, essentially. Mm. Um, I thought that... Uh, I thought that... I don't know. I thought it was a clean enough fight, right? I thought um, Hakeem... Hakeem looked okay. Zubera has that weird style, and I know that you're going to tell me about that style in a second, but he has that weird style that just doesn't really seem fit for MMA, to be truly honest with you. It just doesn't seem to work. It's clunky. It's awkward. And, and you know, I just, I think it's tough. It's tough for Zubaira because if you are somebody that's a really good striker, it's going to be hard for them to beat you, right? Yeah. And if you're, if you're a really good wrestler, and obviously Zubaira has some really lovely transitions, which we saw in that fight, right? But if you're a really good wrestler, then it's going to be hard for him to shoot on you because he shoots from so far away. Um, yeah, I just think it's tough. Like, what did you think? Yeah, it was a tough one. I think as well in the analysis that we had before, we got we got the dynamic of of the fight pretty. We guessed it pretty close, I think. So, um, for me beforehand, it was Hakeem has really good leg kicks. He's very good at picking people off at a distance. Zabera struggles with that. Zabera is very good at blitzing him with a right hand. Hakeem struggles with fighters like that. And I think that all the way through, it was kind of, you know, was Hakeem going to land more low kicks and was Zabera going to blitz him with that yeah. right hand? And both yeah, of them yeah. landed that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like you said, in terms of Zabera's style, um, 
my issue is what I said in the podcast before is that his grappling and striking styles are almost the complete opposite approach to each other. You know, he has that Dagestani brand of wrestling um, where he's pressuring him for takedowns all the time, except his striking, he's not a pressure striker. You know, he sort of dances off to a distance um, and it makes it difficult when he's backed himself up to the cage to shoot in. I think another fighter who, um, he wasn't as much of an example of this, but um, maybe Merbek Tysimov in some of his fights, like he was very much a, a striker that stuck and moved and defended the takedown. And then whenever he wanted to shoot in, he wouldn't be in the right sort of position in the cage if you think of his fights against, uh, so, or sorry, his fight against Diego Ferreira. But, um, but yeah, I think you're right. He's sort of in an awkward place in the positions of Ferreira. Um, but I think Hakeem, his style really relies on someone coming to him consistently yeah. and Zabera is never going to be that guy. I agree. And I think actually the problem with the, the real problem with Zabera is, is he actually has some really, really good physical skills, right? Some really yeah. good physical, um, his anatomy, like, although he doesn't look great at 145, right? Like he's not ripped and shredded and whatever. He's so fast though. Yeah. He's unbelievably fast. His hands are so quick. His takedowns, his shots are so quick. He shot a double leg and then switched, did an immediate knee drop and took, took Hakeem's back. And man, if I'd have blinked, I'd have missed it. Like it was so fast. And, you know, it just, I don't know. I don't know what it is with him, but he just doesn't seem to be able to put it all together. And there's big holes, big, big holes in his game. One of them being that he misses weight, right? And it's not the first time either. But yeah, for picks, we uh, me and Jack picked Takugov via unanimous decision, which, you know, wasn't too far away. You, you picked Takugov via TKO round two. So yeah. I just, I just imagine that like blitzing right hand, Danny You're a Henry. fucking idiot. Fucking idiot. Anyway, we move on because I don't even want to give you the time of day to defend your decision. Um, Jake Matthews versus Diego Sanchez was one of the saddest fights that I've ever heard. And I've just skipped a fight. So we'll go back to Brad Riddell versus Alex And you Silver. heard the fight. You listened to it. I did. <laughs> Instead Mate, of watch. That's I was going to give you... you had the radio on. I was going to give you my reason for saying heard. But, you know, as always, you decide to shit on me like a big yeah. fag. So uh, Brad Riddell versus Alex De Silva, right? Like, I thought this was a phenomenal performance by Brad Riddell. A really, really good performance. And actually, I thought it was a good performance by Alex De Silva as well. I thought both guys fought really well. And in the end, what it came down to was just grit and determination. Grit, determination, and cardio, right? I thought the first round was clearly Alex De Silva's, right? Took Brad Riddell down, landed some shots, controlled him on the ground. He moved from just guard play to side control, I believe, at one point front headlock positions, all this kind of stuff. Like, just looked really, really good. And, and Brad Riddell was struggling to find his rhythm. And then you just saw the momentum change over that second and third round, right? And it was just, like, Brad Riddell is a, is a really, really fun fighter to watch, right? A really, really fun fighter. And, and I think in a, in a division that's stacked at 155, I'm not sure we're looking at a title challenger or anything like that. But, but we're watching a guy that when he gets in that cage, is going to give us a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, this was probably one of my favourite performances of the night, if not, you know, my favourite, e even yeah. with all, all the other stuff that happened in the card. The thing that I liked about it, though, was that going into this, I, I knew next to nothing about Alex De Silva. So yeah, I was going to... research. Because <laughs> I don't spend any time preparing for these podcasts. Um, but yeah, what basically I was going a lot on what you and Jack were, were telling me um, about him and both of you as well both of what you said came to fruition in the middle of the fight so obviously um, you were talking about his top game and I think early on in the fight the silver's top game yeah I was really surprised that this guy that I never heard of he really didn't have many graps in it any gaps in his grappling um, at all really like the riding time he managed to get in on Brad Riddell who we've all spoken about is amazing at getting back to his feet and counter wrestling was really impressive and for a second I thought you know we could be seeing a shutout upset victory here but then I also think the things that uh, Jack shed a pretty interesting light on about the camp that Alex Silva comes from and the 
sort of padded records that a lot of the people have. I think that also came into it as well, because if you were looking at their MMA records on paper, you would say that if one of them was a veteran, it was De Silva, okay? But, it was his 24th fight. Yeah, but Brad Riddell, whether, you know, it's the accumulation of the kickboxing career and everything else, he fought like the veteran there. And, you know, I think the best thing about it was the way, like you said, you saw this great snowball effect from Brad Riddell where he essentially turned the tide of the fight. He's never out of a fight, I don't think, Brad Riddell, any fight that you watch him in. And those second and third rounds were just amazing that he went from being, you know, dominating the grappling to just seeming to land combination after combination with no yeah. answer from the silver. Yeah. I mean, I think if that fight had another round, he would have stopped the silver, I think. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. But I thought both fighters put in a good performance, really. Like, the silver weathered the storm in the last two and three, and he managed to get through it, right? So, mm. so fair play to him. Um, and Brad Riddell was just, yeah, it was just a fucking train wreck. And Brad Riddell actually said that in his post-fight press conference. He said, like, I may only, this may only be my 10th fight, but I've been in this game a long time. Like, I've fought a long time, right? I know how to manage a fight. And, yeah, I mean, what was also hilarious was at the very end, Brad Riddell was beginning to... He, he said he wanted to point to the middle of the cage and just have a scrap for the last 15 seconds. <laughs> but Eugene Berman realized what was coming and shouted to Brad, the only way you lose this is by a Hail Mary punch. And Brad in his head was like, fuck's sake. Like, he knows me too well, right? <laughs> But yeah, a, a brilliant performance from Brad Riddell and picks. I mean, Jesus Christ, Sean. So <laughs> what have I done now? So Sean picks Riddell first round knockout. <laughs> sure. That went well. The only fucking round that he lost. <laughs> Jack Riddell via round two knockout. Also shit house. Uh, I picked Riddell via unanimous decision because oh, of course you did because I am Harry, I'm perfect. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> Other than the Izzy Adesanya, we'll forget that. Um, yeah, so we move on to just just the the the, the saddest fight of the night by by a long long way. And the reason why I said heard the like it was one of the saddest fights that I'd heard that <laughs> night was because you didn't really hear much from Jake Matthews's corner. To be truly honest, you didn't you didn't hear much. But you heard from Diego Sanchez's corner, legitimate advice being shouted from Stefan Bonner in between screams of here comes the nightmare. And then you heard Sean's doppelganger screaming absolute horse shit from the side and Diego just immediately <laughs> reacting to those things. And we saw Diego come in with the body shape that I've got, you know, and he came in and he just looked awful, right? Like you said to me in the first round, Diego doesn't look too bad. And I wasn't sure whether it was sarcasm or not, but it was just awful. Like Jake Matthews is not that good of a fighter. Let's be honest. He's not that great. Like he's okay. He was a good prospect, but he just doesn't manage to put it really truly together. And yet in that fight, like Diego was just a punch bag, essentially, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was a rough one. I think um, to clarify, first of all, what I said about Diego doesn't look too bad. At this point, and I think I said this to you at the time as well, yeah. my bar is set pretty low for Diego. Like, I love Diego Sanchez. I, I've loved his career. I, th I think he's, he's an amazing, he's a legend without a doubt, but I've been wanting him to hang up the gloves for quite some time. So when I said he's not looking too bad, I mean, you know, he's not getting hit with a Matt Brown elbow and getting flatlined in the first round, which, you know, aware is what I worry about the most of them going out there at the moment. But to touch on another thing that was like bizarre about the fight, which you were talking about, it's you have two cornermen, okay? You've got Joshua Fabia, I mean, who essentially has no like qualifications of any How sort of substance. Dare you? And then, are you are you part of their school of self worth or, or whatever it's Mate, called? If you saw Diego Sanchez moving his energy around that octagon, <laughs> you'd be a believer as well. So you had Joshua Fabia on one side, yeah, and then you've got Stefan Bonner, who. You know, it still seemed a strange sort of corner choice because from what Diego said, it was basically just because it brought some like ultimate fighter nostalgia back. But either way, Stefan Bonner's been there, you know, he's done it, he's got more experience. 
everything Stefan would say, Diego would barely listen to. And the minute, the minute uh, Fabio chimed in the corner, like Diego was looking at him, like every word he said was gospel. Like it was, it was absolutely bizarre. Um, but yeah, overall thoughts, I'm happy that Diego didn't get absolutely battered. I'd really like him to retire. Um, and the only good thing about this fight was the, the sort of recreation of the Jorge Masvidal Ben Askren flying knee um, in round three. There was something like kind of special and inspirational about that. But um, outside of that, it was pretty, yeah, it was pretty sad. I don't even reckon I could have hit my nan when she was sitting in a chair with that flying knee. <laughs> it wasn't, the elevation wasn't there. You watch Jorge do it, he like flies two meters into the air. Like Diego, Diego it Sanchez. more like he was skipping in a park or something. <laughs> it was like Diego wanted to land a, f- a flying thigh shot. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Wanted to knee him in the thigh. Jake just... Matthews is a big guy compared yeah. to him as well. So he would have had to have gone high up. Oh, into it's, the fucking air to land that. it's fucking tragic. It's fucking tragic. Yeah. So we move on. We move on. Actually, sorry, let's have a look. What were the picks? How bad were your picks? Um, okay, we all picked Matthews for a unanimous decision. So thankfully, we got that one right. Oh, good. I was so worried for a second there. I'd pick like, Sanchez. Like, <laughs> you picked Sanchez. Yeah, Jesus <laughs> um, so we move on to what was really, this was a sad one as well, to be honest. Shane Young versus Ludovic Klein. So, so Sean, because he does no research and is an absolute casual, knew nothing about Ludovic Klein. Um, <laughs> But Shane Young was supposed to fight Nate Landwehr, who is just a, t- a totally different package, right? Like an unbelievably Completely different package. Different. Yeah. So just, just to put this into, into real, real perspective, Nate Landwehr was 14 and three. His, his first fight in the UFC was a loss to Herbert Burns, who, as we know, is no fucking striker, but managed to finish it with a knee in the clinch. And then he beat Darren Elkins because it's Darren Elkins. Um, and he was then going to step in against Shane Young. Shane Young then fights Ludovic Klein. Ludovic Klein has fought almost everywhere, head kicks everyone all the time, is known for that left high kick. And he just came in and he just obliterated Shane Young, unfortunately. Like he looked faster in the boxing range, he looked faster in the pocket, he looked faster moving into the pocket. And then we saw the left high kick come and Shane Young was just gone, finished out. See you later. The fight lasted a minute and 16 seconds. There's really nothing to talk about. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you, you're right. This, this, was a re- this was a rough one for, for Shane Young because I'm a fan of Shane Young. Me you too. Know? To be honest, I was looking forward to him having a bit of a showcase fight because, I mean, he debuted against Volkanovski. You know, he's Jesus not had Christ. an easy path in the UFC <laughs> at all. Um, and for this last minute opponent change and to have an opponent come in, you know, who, like I said to you, I'd never heard of Ludovic Klein before this fight, but I expect that after I'm going to be hearing a lot more about him. And striking-wise, and again, this this is just going off from what you've told me about his background in boxing and every and everything else. It seems like um, from the off, we've spoken about how the city kickboxing guys, they're all very footwork orientated. And it just seemed that Shane from the off was really struggling to win that foot position, which is common when you get elite boxers. It's something you see a lot when people fight PT on. There's like this, this second where they just cannot get the right position in and then they're getting teed off on. Um, and you know, the, it was just the the finish itself was so impressive as well. Like switching stance through, slipping a punch, and then choosing to go for the uppercut. Because a lot of guys in the UFC, you know, like fighters to one level or another, can slip punches. But usually, it's such a quick thing that they have one strike they throw. So like Roy Nelson, he'll slip a jab and he'll always throw an overhand right. Okay, because he's not as elite striker to slip the punch, see where the person's positioning is, where their head is, and then choose another strike. Whereas you look at people like McGregor or anyone that gets into that position, like Ludovic did, saw where the head was, and he's like, right, the uppercut is the shot I'm choosing. That, for me, is a really exciting striker to keep an eye on. You know, those people that not only slip, but then select the shot that they're going for. It's, yeah. uh, it's going to be exciting to watch him for sure. The only bad thing is he missed weight again. Missed weight by four pounds. Which, yeah. I mean, okay, it's a short notice fight. I get it. But you still missed weight by four pounds. 
Yeah, and that stat you told me, Harry, a while ago, um, it keeps getting proven even now. That, and it yeah. blew my mind at the time how many of these fighters that miss weight are winning these fights. You know, I don't know what the fraction would be now, but, you know, I think... Obviously, Israel. I thought one good thing about uh, Israel's win afterwards was obviously he, he brought up the issue, yeah. and I think he's right. I think you know, like yes, he's had part of his purse deducted, but for the stock that he's gained from the win in this fight, it's mm -hmm. it's not that money doesn't matter that he's lost. No, no, no. no I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, so the card really fucking tails off from here, mate. I'm not going to lie to you. We've now got. <laughs> oh God. We've now got. Probably the freak of all freaks versus a poor Alexa Kimor. We've got Juan Espino versus you. And then we've got Danilo Marquez versus Cadiz Ibragimov. So we'll start with William Knight versus Alexa Kimor. So I'm just going to sum this up really quickly, right? Um, William Knight is going to lose to good fighters. That's it. What happened in that fight is William just big brothered Alexa a lot. Landed some shots when he wanted to. He um, he allowed. He basically took himself down and put himself put Alexa in back mount by himself without Alexa really doing anything. Um, and then when he decided he didn't want to be have Alexa on his back anymore, he just decided to stand up um, and then just just stood up. Um, his takedowns against Alexa were more a train running through a piece of plywood than they were, you know, like like legitimate technical takedowns um and yeah i mean yeah jesus kim Moore just couldn't get onto it just couldn't get him off him and he just couldn't land enough to to make him really have any respect for kim Moore. um i think that yeah if you put william knight against anyone in the top 20 of that division it's, it's not going to look good i really really think so yeah um i think you're right though i think the surprising thing for me was going into this i thought alexa was the real freak athlete out of the two of them after watching like such a big guy land that flying knee on contenders you know i was yeah. expecting to see something like that but big brothered is the best way to describe the way that this fight went like i think i messaged you halfway through where i was like i think william knight is just winning on virtue of just being a bit of a fucking beast <laughs> like yeah. there's not like anything you could point to particularly technically like i thought his throws that he was going for from the wizard were good and everything else but they were kind of bizarre in the sense that say if islam makachev goes for the same uchi Mata, there's like a real setup to that and he's catching the guy after he's made him go off balance whereas william knight it was as if he was just making the decision like i just want you grounded now you're just on the floor so <laughs> there you go you're there and it was it was you know it was a really weird one to to watch but I agree with you. It's the sort of crux for any athletic fighter. You know, there will be things you can do naturally that other people need to work out technical ways to overcome. Yeah. Um, and I think if there's any hope for him to break into those big ranks, he has to, to sort of... Learn how to fight? Learn how to fight is, is an incredibly harsh way of putting it. But, but yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah, at least, you know... For, not be as attribute based you know because yeah. those are always going to be there but at least train in a way where it's skill based i think if you'd have just said at least train that'd have been fine <laughs> at least train full stop he probably didn't he probably just showed up and Mate, was like, the crazy thing about this, this was afterwards in his post press conference he was asked like do you cut any weight he said he started camp at 256 pounds no. he weighed in at 205 <laughs> oh my God. Fuck me! It just shows as well if he can make weight, like Ludovic Klein, any of these guys can make weight. You know? Yeah, this that motherfucker dropped twenty kilos. <laughs> it's mental. <laughs> Fuck me. Um, so, do you want to do you want to talk about your loss to Juan Espino, or do you want me? Yeah, to? this is a tough one. I actually think there, there is an interesting talking point in this. Okay. Um, just for the listeners, I didn't fight Ran Espino. Um, as always, Harry's being childish. But um, so you're saying that you and Jeff Hughes don't look alike. Is that what you're saying? Just because he's be got fair, tattoos, you look you look different. <laughs> the tattoos are the only thing separating us. You're right. This is ridiculous. I'm um, sick of your shit. But yeah, but the interesting thing was, and the thing I thought you were going to troll me about more was that this came from 
a front headlock Kasakatami finish at the end, okay? But it's, it's an interesting point to sort of go into because I watched the rest of the fight. He, he grappled really well. He was know, really, really in good. In general. Really impressive. Because when I saw the finish, I did have this image in my mind that he like sort of just Sergei Spivats, this guy, <laughs> like just, just went in, grabbed him, just was just ramming him with these front headlocks like over and over again, which, you know, would have killed me inside, as you know. But the finish at the end was actually interesting because as much as I do hate on the, the Keskatami stuff and everything else, I think in heavyweight MMA and jiu-jitsu, there is arguably a place for it. Like what yeah. it reminded me of is obviously the famous example for me was when Josh Barnett went against Dean Lister. Mm -hmm. And out of all the things, because I think Dean Lister was on an eight, maybe 10 year run of not being subbed in competition. The submission that got him was this Keskatami finish, you know, after all those years. I think it just comes with a caveat that you have to be um, a heavyweight. You've got to be someone with a pretty serious amount of mass to pull this off. Like, I don't think we're going to see Brandon Royval sort of pulling this off anytime soon. But I mean, fuck, who knows Brandon Royval actually, but you know, but it was a good, it was a good performance for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the way the finish came is actually a lot to do with how the sub happened. So I spoke to Liam, uh, a friend of mine that doesn't know, shout out to Liam Khan, uh, black belt and co-owner of Scramble Academy Leeds and Sean's coach, one of Sean's, Sean's coaches. Like he said that the reason why it worked as well is because Wan transitioned from regular side to crawl, side control to judo side control and brought uh, your back off the cage, off the floor, right? And because he had a way to trap your shoulder into your neck, the, the pull wasn't a crank. It was a, it's a, it feels like a legitimate choke when it comes on. And Wan also used the cage. He pushed off the cage to stop because Jeff is obviously trying to get his back to the floor, right? And he's using the cage to create that lever, create that counter pressure to put the choke on. Now, sure, it may just be that because he's a fucking big monster that, you know, weighed in at whatever he weighed in at. Let's see what he weighed in at. Something redonkulous. Yeah, he weighed in at 255 pounds, right? <laughs> Like, whether it's a guy that weighs 150 kilos talking on your neck that feels a little bit uncomfortable. That's I could possibly, see that. Yeah, I could see yeah. that as well. But, you know, according to, to Jiu-Jitsu minds greater than ours, it's a legitimate choke and you are safe from any head and arm robbery. But um, either way, you look shit in that fight. Do better. Cheers. Yeah, I, I need to work on that quite a bit. So I'll go back to the instructional. <laughs> did you, please, please do. I can't wait for that to come out. I really can't. Did you watch Danilo Marquez versus Cadiz Ibragimov? I actually watched it just before the podcast because it was one that sort of slipped my... Um, yeah. Slipped please, my can notice. I talk about it? Please, can I Yeah, of course, of course. So this fight was absolutely hilarious, right? <laughs> it was hilarious for all the wrong reasons. So Danilo Marquez comes in, makes his UFC debut on short notice. Kadis Ibragimov, Ibra Ibragimov, Ibragimov is running a three-fight skid at this point, losing to Da'un Young. That's not a joke. Uh, via stand <laughs> standing guillotine. <laughs> he then loses to Ed Herman, which is, you know, it is what it is. Ed Herman's been around and whatever. Loses by unanimous decision. He then loses to Roman Dolid Dolidze. Dolids. Uh, round one, a bad knee and ground and pound. So this fight starts and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. New fresh he light heavyweight. Let's see what we've got. Neither of these guys can throw a punch, right? Neither of them. It's like watching Roman, uh, sorry, watching Cadiz was like watching somebody practice on a Wing Chun wooden dummy. That's what it looked like. He was throwing everything and missing absolutely everything. He was as stiff as a board. It was just <laughs> awful, right? Then... Danilo Marquez, in all three rounds, somehow manages to come up on a single leg, take this guy's back, because for some reason, Kadis Ibragimov just doesn't know what a wizard is, or risk control, just has no idea. Gets his back taken, stands up, and Danilo Marquez just holds him. Doesn't even do anything. He doesn't punch him. He doesn't try and break his posture. He doesn't threaten a choke. He does absolutely nothing. He just backpacks him for three rounds. And I, oh my God. Even at one point, he had Kadis Ibragimov on the floor. 
He had his back, both hooks. He had a seatbelt and he just fucking sat there. Both of these guys should be cut for that performance. Absolute <laughs> shit out to both of them. Like, obviously, we have to respect fighters and all this, but fuck me, that was atrocious. <laughs> Mate, you've been so disrespectful. You can't just add that on, on the end after com- just dragging these, oh. two poor, t- these two poor fighters' names through the mud. To be the fair, they should be apologising to me after dragging no. me through that fight. Harry, you're so disrespectful. Oh you're my disgusting, God. honestly. Try and tell me that that was a good fight to watch. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll try my best to make a case. <laughs> I'll be a, it will be a, a very difficult case to make. So, on um, oh. Bragamov's oh. side... I thought Abramov was like, especially these COVID matchups where guys get brought into the UFC who maybe shouldn't be in the UFC. I think the important thing to do is to make sure that you're not showing that you're just happy to be there. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> Abramov, maybe the he most had a neon outwardly, sign above his head. <laughs> yeah, then he may be the most outwardly I'm happy to be there fighter <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> But especially, especially the bit where, um, I don't know if you saw this, but it came from these sort of transitions you, you're referring to with the, the sort of long periods of back control and not much happening. But Danilo Marquez had him in like a back control with that sort of Kimura seatbelt over the head. And Ibragamov just turns to the camera and slicks his hair yeah. back and smiles. I was oh like, God. is this guy, I've not seen anything like that since like... Um, like Nick David Diaz. Gardner versus Shinya Aoki, you know, the one where he waved to the crowd and said, like, hi, <laughs> Japan, and then got choked. <laughs> Except, you know, Abramov didn't sake. get choked. He just, he just slipped his hair back. But I was like, is this guy just fighting to make a gif or, like, a meme <laughs> of himself? Like, does he have any sort of ambitions of UFC career? But, yeah, th- this, was a, this was a weird one. I felt like Marquez at least sort of came to the fight with, with an ambition to sort of win it, but... Yeah, I think the the back control. The, the I don't know anything about Marquez, but he struck me as another guy that has come from jiu-jitsu and transitioned into MMA. Because there were lots of times where he was in that back control, getting shrugged over the top, kind of like very like uh, the Doom versus Olenek. Mm-hmm. Um, he could really do with like that sort of Suliov stretch side to his game that you see like Zabit doing and Khabib and all those guys. But I mean, <laughs> I'm the same as you. I feel like this is an anomaly that should never have happened but in a way we, we were blessed that it did oh my god what a way to open this card like i remember it was like i don't know just gone midnight and i was openly laughing at my screen at this point <laughs> like when this motherfucker had the audacity he had his back taken for a li- like two minutes at this point and this motherfucker slicked his hair back <laughs> and smiled directly into the camera like jesus christ <laughs> Oh, me, oh that's just, the right word. They should have just stopped the fight and it would have been a, a, a Ibragimov win via TKO just for the disrespectful nature of some guy having your back and you just slick back your hair and smile at the camera. Like, unbelievable. Yeah, to, yeah losing the whole fight as well in the critical <laughs> round that you've got to win. Just, oh. I'm going to slip back my hair. In the old scoring system, those were three 10-8 rounds. Yeah, <laughs> I Ibragimov loved every minute. <laughs> okay, loved it. He loved it. He loved it all. It was just awful, <laughs> awful, awful MMA. Awful. Yeah. But but I mean, look, these things do happen in MMA. They really, really do. Um, but yeah, that brings us to the end of that card, thankfully. And what a fucking way to start. Like, it's so beautifully ironic that we start with Danilo Marquez versus Kalis Ibrahimov. I honestly think me and you could have put on a hot, more high-level MMA fight than those two guys. And then Israel Adesanya versus Paolo Costa to finish, which is just the other end of absolute elite MMA, right? Absolute elite MMA. Um, do you have any closing thoughts about this card before I shit talk you some more? Um... Not maybe just the the John Jones Izzy matchup, the potential for that. What what yeah. do you think? I mean, look, I think that if they do it at light heavyweight, I think it's a very interesting fight, a really really interesting fight. There's no way that John Jones is going to make middleweight, right? 
Um, yeah, and yeah, equally, sure. I don't, I don't really see. I mean, John Jones is the A side in this fight, so I don't see that John Jones going down to middleweight has any merit whatsoever. Um, this isn't a Cody Garbrandt going and chasing a second lease of life type of thing, where he's you know he's dropping down even as a name. I think that. I think it's a good matchup for Izzy. I really do. I think that, um, I think John is obviously phenomenal. He solves problems whilst the problems are happening. He's got really underrated wrestling. He's got a really, 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 really underrated jiu-jitsu game for a blue belt. And can we just cut in here? Like we're talking about Hamzat Shimaev, right? Imagine you go to a Naga and Hamzat Shimaev's in your division. Imagine you go to a Naga, absolute, and John Jones steps on the mat in front of you. Oh, no. Fuck that. But anyway, like, you know, I think though, I don't want to see it at heavyweight. That's my only problem. I think if it goes to heavyweight, I know that Eugene Berman has said the heavier that John Jones gets, the better for us. But are we going to see John Jones at heavyweight? It's kind of an anomaly, right? Are we going to see John Jones with Daniel Cormier esque transitions at heavyweight? Are we going to see him go in and just flatline dudes? I don't know. I really don't know. Like, John Jones is one of those, like, we've seen his brothers, freak athletes, amazing physiques, monsters of men. John Jones looks thick when he lifts weights. We've seen that in the transition when he was, when he was off for his picogram issues. And, you know, at heavyweight, what happens? I don't know. I think Israel Adesanya's footwork is better than John Jones's footwork. I think Israel Adesanya as a pure striker is better. I think Israel Adesanya's creativity is not better than John Jones. Uh, I think what we've seen now that I've watched Izzy a lot, he does a lot of the same things, but he just does them amazingly well. Whereas John Jones in his earlier career just did anything, anything that was there. He just threw it. He just saw it and he threw it and that was it. Fight IQ is where I'm really interested here because obviously the wrestling and everything else is well in John Jones's favor. That's fine. That's fine. I think that goes without saying, but the fight IQ is where this fight becomes really, really, really interesting. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. Um, I agree with you. It, it has to happen at light heavyweight. But one reason today I was thinking about it and I thought it was so interesting is it is almost like um, it really reminds me of when Anderson was getting to the tail end of his title run mm -hmm. um, and he was getting matched up against a young John Jones just after beating Shogun, like Shogun who were, and, you know, it was like one of those super fights that never really happened. And I think the more I watch even the sort of peaks and troughs of uh, Izzy's career, he's very similar to, he's like a new era, Anderson Silver, in a lot of ways. Like obviously, you know, first of all, he's a guy that um, striking-wise is levels above the competition in his era. But also just the way that both of them will either have a fight that is a tentative five-round match if they're against someone. You know, for Izzy, that's like a Yo Romero um, or like even when he went against Anderson, then for Anderson, he would completely blow through people and then have a fight against Talis Lates or Damian Meyer where it was very tensive and nothing happened. And even, even as characters, they're both very like eccentric kind of, you know, for want of a better word, kind of weird people, like both of them. Um, so, yeah, I think him versus John Jones versus uh, Izzy is almost like that matchup sort of reverse. Like now you've got John Jones at the tail end of his career meeting, um, or not necessarily the tail end, but there's been evidence that he is, um, you Slowing know, down. yeah, slowing down. And, you know, that run is going to end eventually at, while Israel is at the peak of his powers, but still very early on in his career. So, yeah, for all of those, I think it's really interesting. But, I mean, John Jones has called out so many people and been called out by so many different people. I mean, he was going to fight Francis Ngannou last week. So, who knows? Who knows? My only thing on the slowing down thing is I think that's not to do with age, but to do with time in the cage, right? Because Izzy is only two years younger than John. Now, mm. he's... And this is the thing as well, like, John Jones has had 27 fights in MMA. Izzy's had 20, All right? Izzy's had 100 professional fights and yeah. bountiful amateur fights. John Jones, according to his record, doesn't have an amateur career, but I'm sure he does, right? Like, um, 
And obviously he had the stiffest test of his career, five fights in against your mate, Parker Porker. Um, <laughs> that was a rough one for him on the regional scene. <laughs> it was seat. a rough one. You know what's absolutely crazy? He goes from blamming Parker Porker in 30 seconds to five fights later, fighting Brandon Vera, Ryan Bader, Mauricio Hua, and Quinton <laughs> fucking Rampage Jackson. Do you know what I mean? You don't get much more of a run-up than that. But yeah, I mean, look, Izzy is, Izzy is the fresher fighter. It looks like he's the fresher fighter. But we just, I, just, I just don't know. Like, I really, really don't know. I think for me to pick this fight, I'd need to do a ton of research. Yeah. Yeah, a ton so. of research. Because John has the ability to do what Izzy does in terms of being a counter-striker, managing the distance. One thing that John Jones does amazingly well against everyone is distance management. It's one of his greatest assets. That ridiculous wingspan that he's got. Ridiculous range. That's Izzy's thing too. What did we see against Costa? He just kept out of range, just kept out of range, just kept out of range. Okay, cool. My leg kicks out. My leg kicks out. My leg kicks out. My leg kicks out. That's similar. It's a similar style to John. Just the way that they actually approach that style is drastically different, right? Mm. My only thing is that John seems like a tame fighter now. Whereas John Jones of old was a knockout artist and we knew he was a knockout. He was a finisher. Now it feels like he's less of a finisher. Okay. The Daniel Cormier thing and whatever, but in his, in his fights against OSP, in his fights against Tiago Santos, Anthony Smith, like these are fights where he just seemed happy, happy to just glide along the fight, win all five rounds and go home with the belt. Is that because he doesn't feel like those guys really challenge him? Like there's really anything for him in those fights? Maybe. But then my argument to that is Dominic Reyes took that fight to him and I didn't see John Jones open up to fourth, fifth, sixth gear like we used to see him. Is it because they're not there anymore? I don't know. But it's a fight I'd watch. That's for sure. For sure. For sure. All right. Any other closing statements? Any news for me? Any thoughts? Any, any well wishes to anyone that's not here? <laughs> I thought you were going to say well wishes to you then. I was like, I mean, if you want not. to, mate, feel free. Um, let me think. Um, not really. I feel like most of my complaints for this week were sort of aired during the episode. Um, I will work as hard as I can to overcome my loss to Juan. Um, yeah, please do. My neck still feels quite sore. Um, I mean, it's really, really ironic. Very strong. As, mate, from your performance, I don't think you are. I really, <laughs> I really don't think you are, mate. I actually really hope that, you know, not, not Jerry, I hope Jeff Hughes, you know, has a good career or whatever, but maybe outside the UFC, because I know every card he gets put on, I'm just going to, I'm going to get called the Jeff Hughes now. Every single yeah. card. Jeff Hughes, uh, mate. Like, look, for anyone that doesn't, if, if think that Sean is, is trying to play this down, go to Jeff Hughes' topology page and look at his profile photo and tell me that that is not Sean McGuinness. Sean is going to do it right now, just so he can see. But for anyone, that, um, you... for anyone that managed to get this far into the podcast, one, congratulations. And two, yeah, like, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. But go, wow. go and look at that and tell me that that doesn't look like Sean McGuinness. <laughs> With the LFA belt. Of course. I didn't know that you was the LFA champion. You know what so... LFA stands for when you've got a belt? Least favorite organization. That's what it stands for when you've got that belt. Even though there's an A at the end. Association is what you I meant. Did. Oh my god. <laughs> at least pick the right word. Oh Harry. mate, I was just I was so fucking I was so deep into the joke that I fucked it. I fucked it. Um but yeah, anyway, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this out because otherwise we're just gonna talk shit to each other. Um as That's always true. as always, Jeff, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um Please make sure that you apologize to Uncle Jan. But um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And I suspect the next card we're going to do is, is the Habib versus Gaethje card. Um, oh my God. Yeah, oh my God, indeed. Um, there will be a special guest joining us for that podcast. So watch out for that. Tune in for that. And, uh, and yeah, other than that, you're a dick. But thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Harry. <laughs>